Welcome to this micro lecture on the anterior neck and upper arm. By the end of this lecture, I hope you're able to compare regions of the brachial plexus with different anatomical landmarks. Apply the neurovascular pathways as they pass through three entrapment sites of thoracic outlet syndrome. Compare the regions of the large vessels serving these, these areas, the anterior neck and the upper arm and apply the origin and insertion of the feature muscles of this video, which are the scalenes, sternocleidomastoid, and pectoralis minor muscles, to their function. A quick review over the brachial plexus. Uh, it's, the fi uh, it's the nerve roots coming from C5 through T1, and uh, you have the ventral rami forming the roots. So we have the roots, trunks, divisions, cords, and branches. And a mnemonic for this is Randy Travis drinks cold beer. And for the country music aficionados out there, you know cold beer is in a lot of country music. So this works out well with Randy Travis. But one of our feature muscles, the scalenes, you have the anterior and middle scalenes where the brachial plexus passes through. And as it's passing through the scalenes, it's your roots. And by the time it comes out of the scalenes, it's converged into the trunks. And then if we follow the trunks, as it goes under the clavicle, between the first rib and the clavicle, it's called divisions. Once it comes out from under the clavicle, now it's the cords. And the cords are named according to their relationship to the axillary artery. So we have the medial cord, the lateral cord, and the posterior cord. And then it terminates into the branches. Before we get started, I want to ask a question so we can pause this. I want you to, to predict what symptoms you would think you would get from compression of the neurovascular bundle of each individual component. So the nerves, the arteries, and the veins. So what would you expect from compression of nerves, arteries, and veins? So I'm going to let you pause it for a second. If you're in a group, you can uh, talk amongst yourself and, and come up with some answers. So with the nerves, you're going to get neurogenic pain, which is described as uh, sharp shooting pain down the entire arm. Uh, and then you could get paresthesias, which are numbness and tingling. You can, With arterial compression, you could get cold hands, pale hands. You could get some cramping and pain in the hands. Your, the pulse would be weaker distal to that compression site. Uh, you might have a lower blood pressure on the brachial artery if, if it's, a, you know, all the TOS compression sites are above that. Um, and you can compare it to the other arm. And as far as veins, veins are bringing blood back to the heart. So if you're compressing that, you're going to get some back, back flow and some edema into that upper extremity. So let's move over to the virtual dissection. So if we remove the skin from the anterior neck, we have the platysma muscle. It's a real thin muscle. It's so thin, if you feel over your clavicle, you're, it just feels like skin and bone. But that thin muscle is actually in there. So let's get rid of that and look at the sternocleidomastoid. So the sternocleidomastoid has an origin site. It has a sternal head and a clavicular head. And then it, it has an insertion point in the mastoid process right behind the ear. So if you contract one side unilaterally, the head will turn to the opposite side. And you can palpate this muscle, especially if you turn your head to the opposite way, you'll feel it contract. If you contract bilaterally, you're going to get flexion of the cervical spine and flexion of the head forward. Um, if we were to reverse the origin insertion, so the origin is always the fixed point and the insertion is what's moving. If we now make the mastoid process the fixed point, um, then the insertions would be down here on the, the manubrium of the sternum and the clavicle. So you could actually use this as an accessory muscle to inspiration. So if you're, you know, most of the time when you're in, inspiring, your diaphragm is able to get enough air into your lungs. But if you're exercising, you might need to call upon some other muscles and this will help elevate the clavicle and get some more space and, and draw more air into the, the lungs. 
let's get rid of the sternocleidomastoid and look at the scalene muscles. So the scalene muscles, they originate from the transverse processes of C3 through C7 collectively. And then they insert, the anterior middle scalenes insert on the first rib. And then the posterior scalene will make it to the second rib. And the, the insertion points, so the movable parts are the ribs. So these are accessory muscles to um, inspiration as well. So you're going to get some lift out and up of the first and second rib. And that's going to help get more air into the lungs. You can see the phrenic nerve passing over the anterior scalene. That's actually going to the diaphragm to innervate the diaphragm. And we have the nerve roots from C5 to T1 coming through the the scalenes and then we have the trunks here and then it's going to turn into divisions as it passes under. Let's look at some of the vascular supply to these this region. Let's start with the subclavian artery. So the arch of the aorta has three major branches. The first one is the bra brachiocephalic. It's going to provide blood supply to the right half of the brain and face and right arm. Then you have the second branch, which is the common carotid artery, left common carotid artery. It's going to feed the blood supply to the left side of the face and brain. The next um, branch is the left subclavian artery, and it passes behind that anterior scalene with the brachial plexus. So now you can see if your scalenes are tight, it could put compression on this, this the artery and the 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 nerves there. So here's the thoracocervical thyrocervical trunk coming off of the uh, left subclavian artery. It branches into the um, inferior thyroid artery which will go and provide some blood supply to the thyroid and then that one branches a um, ascending cervical artery that will allow, provide some blood supply to the scalene muscles. If we follow that left subclavian artery out, uh, it'll turn into the axillary artery. Here's the thoracochromial artery coming off the axillary artery. It's going to actually provide blood supply to the overlying pectoralis minor that's been removed so that we can see this vessel well. And then once you get past the axilla, the axillary artery is now going to become the brachial artery. Let's look at the venous system. So you have the the left subclavian vein, it's going to pass in front of the anterior scalene, so it can't get compressed by the scalenes, but it joins the left subclavian artery and brachial plexus going underneath the clavicle. So this, this is site one of compression. The next site is the costoclavicular space. So costo is referring to the first rib clavicular for the clavicle, and it's a tight space already. So you can imagine if there's, if that's, that could be a compression site. And then the third site is where uh, it travels behind the pectoralis minor muscle. So this is the third featured muscle. The pectoralis minor muscle originates from the coracoid process of the scapula, inserts into ribs three, four, and five, and this is an accessory muscle of inspiration. So you, you know, it can expand the rib cage. If we flip the origin insertion, if we make the origin ribs three, four, and five, and the insertion at the coracoid process, that could cause protraction or movement of your scapula forward. And you can imagine if your pectoralis minor is tight, it can compress on this neurovascular bundle, getting the axillary vein, the axillary artery, and um, the uh, cords of the brachial plexus at that level. Let's go back to the original PowerPoint. One thing I want to make note of, thoracic outlet syndrome can cause, you know, pain, uh, neurogenic pain into the, the ex upper extremity, but it's not the most common cause. I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, in the clinic, I see a lot more herniated disc touching on nerve roots. So you can see the nucleus pulposus has herniated and it's impinging on the nerve root. That's a much more common cause of neurogenic pain, but do keep TOS on your differential diagnosis. And I liked it, I just liked it because it, it helps us to correlate 
the topographic relationships of the brachial plexus and the major vessels. So again, the three sites of compression of the brachial plexus could be at the root level between the anterior middle scalene, that's called the interscalene space, or under the costoclavicular area, that's where the divisions are, or it could be under the pectoralis minor where you have the cords. I want to go over a post-lecture quiz and then I'll finish with some videos just showing some special tests to look at these three different sites and then a quick idea on how to treat uh, TOS from each of the different sites. Um, before we get into the lecture, I want to show you this this radiograph, this x-ray. You know, we the vast majority of people have 12 ribs coming off the 12 thoracic vertebrae, the transverse processes on each side. But occasionally somebody can have a cervical rib. So you can see C7 the, the, um, have, coming off those transverse processes. You can see a cervical rib. This one's a tough one to treat with physical therapy. Um, you might have to have a, a, the cervical rib resected. So first question, which region of the brachial plexus is compressed between the anterior and middle scalene muscles? I'll give you a second to... Pause the video there. The answer is the roots. Question two, which of the following are accessory muscles of inspiration? The scalene, sternocleidomastoid, pectoralis major, minor, excuse me, or all the above? And the answer is all the above. You remember the scalenes, they pull on ribs one and two. The sternocleidomastoid can pull on the clavicle and the sternum and the pectoral can pull on ribs three through five. This picture is a good example of someone with COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease like emphysema, where to, you know the diaphragm just doesn't get enough air into their lungs, so they have to use these accessory muscles all the time, and you can see how hypertrophied or enlarged his sternocleidomastoid muscles are. If we were to uh, look at his scalenes and his pec minor, I'm sure those are also hypertrophied. Last question, what are the names of the vascular structures passing underneath the pectoralis minor tendon? Is it the subclavian artery and vein, the axillary artery and vein, brachial artery and vein, or the thyrocervical trunk? Okay, so at this level, it's the axillary artery and vein that are passing underneath the pec minor. So let's look at those final videos. Okay. So here's some special tests for thoracic outlet syndrome. We're gonna start with one that analyzes between the compression between the anterior and middle scalene. It's called the AdSense test. So I'll feel for the pulse and find it. We got a good pulse here. So I'm gonna take his, abduct his arm to 30 degrees and then extend his arm. And then I want you to extend your neck back or head back, excuse me, and then rotate your head towards me. And now take a deep breath and hold it. I still feel a good strong pulse. If he had thoracic outlet syndrome, then um, I would lose the pulse or I'd get really weak and maybe recreate the symptoms a little bit. So the sensitivity and specificity of that test isn't great. So I, I, I kind of look at it on the spectrum and if I completely lose the pulse and recreate symptoms, I know it's a, a pretty good indication. Now let's look for, uh, this next test is for the pec minor. It's called the Wright's test. So I'm gonna uh, bring his, um, shoulder and elbow to 90 degrees. Now feel for the pulse here, and this puts some traction on the pec minor tendon. And so I still feel a really good pulse here, and I'll check that for a minute. And then to check the costoclavicular space, where the uh, neurovascular bundle can be trapped between the first rib and the clavicle, I'm gonna hyper abduct and continue to feel for that pulse. And then again, if I lose the pulse or if it weakens, or recreate symptoms, that'd be a positive test. So now for, for treatment, I'll show you a little treatment for each area. Um, for the scalene stretch, the scalenes are um, where they're located. It, it'd be good to stretch them more, just keeping his head level. You don't want to bring it forward. And I'll hold the shoulder down and that should get a stretch there in the scalene region. 
And then if someone has the costoclavicular, I would stretch the scalenes because they're, if they're tight, they could pull the rib, first rib up and the second rib up. Uh, but I'd also add some uh, first rib mobilization. So I'm, I palpated the first rib here and it's not always real comfortable, but pushing into that and just kind of freeing that up to decompress that area. And then for the pec minor, I'll show you over here in the doorway. If it's tight, you can stretch. You can either do a one arm stretch or you can do both arms and lean into the doorway there. I just want to make sure it's a light stretch for 30 seconds. And then my favorite stretch is on a foam roller. We have Dylan doing it over here if you want to show that, where you can just take deep breaths and lay there for a few minutes and really open up the chest and get a good stretch on that, that pec minor muscle. And then the last thing, uh, a home stretch for the scalenes. If I want to stretch my left scalenes, I would put my left arm behind my back and then just pull to the side until I feel a lot stretch through that region. And again, I would just hold that for 30 seconds. It's good.